Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I am your ever absurdly uh, amateur and completely unprepared host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. And this is a special segment of the almost daily Zencast, your favorite morning talk show Opinion Podcast. And well, I don't know why I insist on framing it as a morning show. I record it at whatever effing time I feel like. <laughs> but uh, here we are. Good morning, Trumptopia. What the actual fuck is going on, folks? Like, what the actual fuck? First of all, there's a really weird minority demographic of Trump supporter on the social media that I have some individual examples of. I think it represents a small demographic. I, I, I have no scientific data to back that up. I just see multiple people who vaguely support Trump, but also say there's something else bigger going on that are adamant, 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 that we all have to, like, hold on to our genitals and brace ourselves because something big's about to happen. The only th big thing I see uh, on the horizon is increasing conflict in the Middle East uh, and, you know, this bizarre move by increasing conflict in the Middle East, I ex explicitly mean um, Israel and uh, and their neighbor, their delightful neighbor. Um, God, my brain wants to say Syria, and I know it's not Syria, damn it. I'm not an idiot. I just, my, I'm, uh, my brain just is on a bend to talk about Syria on top of things. But, uh, but the Israeli-Palestine problem that's just, like, burst into a fresh new hell. For those of you who don't know, they're uh, slapping each other with uh, lots of rockets. And this this incident is the first time since some time in the early 2000s that uh, a rocket from Palestine has actually made it past the defense missile system um, ominously named the Iron Dome. Which makes you think of giant actual dome made out of iron, but just not the case. But um, I always sort of like can't help but have that imagery float in the back of my head whenever anyone else references it. Like it comes up in the news, and I'm like, I see a big giant Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome sort of uh, geodesic structure like over a country. I'm like, oh, that'd be insane. Um, anyways, I digress. They're, they're killing each other some more. Uh, there's plenty of other hotspots around the world. Syria, Yemen, etc. Um, there's all this new, uh, anger and oppression, uh, happening between Muslims and Buddhists, of all people, uh, in two countries. Uh, uh, Myanmar and that other one, forgive me. Uh, it's currently just fell right the back out of my head. Uh, but there's that other country. Um, wow, I sound really terrible when I can't, like, but it has to be understood, folks. I don't have any, I literally don't have any notes in front of me. The, the one thing on my desk in front of me is the program to the last uh, piece of theater that I worked. I do have some pages open on the internet and some notes that I took 
on uh, in my uh, apps on my computer, but I digress. Uh, I was just generally indicating lots of hot spots of conflict around the world. Um, and this new move, this new rather uh, poorly explained, in my opinion, so far, uh, move to antagonize Iran, uh, that's that news is still spreading amongst those who don't watch news. Uh, but uh, we've sent some sort of flotilla, some kind of armada of of uh, warships, uh, and diverted them from what was supposed to be a normal deployment um, in the general vicinity. But now we've we I say we because uh, ultimately whoever might get mad at those boats will collectively hold us all responsible. Um, but we've pushed those boats into waters that are more aggressively close um, and look a bit aggressive uh, towards Iran. Uh, apparently they were doing things to piss us off. I don't know what things. Those things have not been elucidated. We've not been given any information on what those things are or when they happened. But suddenly... Just, what is it, like a day or two after mysteriously talking to Putin, um, the person he's not colluding with, uh, about stuff, uh, most explicitly not about uh, the meddling, the verified factual meddling by Russian entities uh, with the election that just so happened to facilitate his, his uh, margin in winning at the Electoral College level. And the whole Michigas, the whole, as I like to say, clusterfuck of bullshit is getting weirder and weirder. And is that not what I said? Uh, what happened? Um, and But to come back to the point I opened with, uh, or started to go off on a tangent on more accurately, there seems to be a small demographic of people, and I don't know exactly where they are getting their information, because their level of confidence is beyond that which is plausible from any Fox News viewer. Because even from my limited um, uh, uh, surveying of Fox, they themselves are opening up increasingly to a, a narrative that says, well, we sort of criticized him all along. We called him out on his bullshit. Um, because increasingly, some of the Fox News talking heads seem to have a, a counterpoint opinion, uh, uh, um, a, you know, what's that fancy word? An oppositional opinion uh, to their beloved uh, Republican president. And more and more, although it's still a, still a bunch of hoop hoop hurrah, let's blow smoke and talk directly at him and blow smoke up his ass, kind of uh, Michigas most of the time, um, more and more there are some folks that are being given permission, however that works out, uh, however that supposedly works out in their, in their culture, uh, to talk against him. And it's interesting to, uh, to keep an eye on. Um, plausible deniability, right, in all directions. You can't call us some complicit state media machine. We, we were fair and balanced and had two whole journalist uh, desks devoted to criticizing Trump. Um, I don't know. That's not a quote. That's me mocking them. Uh, but here we are in a confusing new chapter where Trump is losing very slowly but steadily, as I've always hoped would be so. I dare, I dare not say predicted, but I always hoped and prayed and encouraged others to hope me to, to join me in hoping and praying that uh, that slowly but surely, gradually, in a way that made sense, um, people who gave Trump their support would be confronted with enough information, enough verifiable facts to make them second guess their decision making process, and not in a not in that self undermining way, but in that like. You got to question everything and you got to update when you have fresh information that's verifiable and you got to you got to move forward, right? And you got to adjust. So, 
there's a counterbalancing phenomena there. There are people who are quadrupling down. We're seeing a, a few more people uh, trying to rally the Jesus. Like, Jesus is working through Trump crowd. Or, there, alternately, believe it or not, there is a Trump might be Jesus crowd. Not that there might be a crowd who thinks there is Jesus, that Trump is Jesus, but there is, in fact, indeed, uh, a measurable number of people that could be summarized as a crowd or a, a, a small uh, sub-demographic of a larger, generally Christian demographic, who are trying to convince themselves, each other, and uh, uh, heathen unbelievers that Trump is some manifestation of their Christian God. And it takes on a couple of different flavors. But So there's the full extreme. And then, of course, there's people uh, on the left that just dislike him, that, that, that had voted, you know, people who were in the center, in the middle, that sort of had tolerated him being, you know, elected and had just hoped that things would move forward in a shake up the system kind of way. What's fascinating, as I just spew out these labels, is that it seems as though these labels, these groups, these demographics, these these groupings of people that can be labeled in the way I just did, uh, the shift is there. Like, people are shifting away for different reasons from Trump, and yet there's a concentration at the base, right, that's, like, trying to double down, triple down, or go to even more extreme in their support of Trump. But I'm not sure how much is shifting or changing in, like, th like the rest of the world. And by that I mean, not the rest of the world. Sorry. In the rest of the population of this country, because the vast pluralia, plurality of it, the vast plurality of Americans, or if we're already to uh, past the point in our turn, Trumptopians, um, don't actually participate in electoral process, even though all the numbers indicate a new surge in participation. It's still pretty arguable that there's this very large block of people that don't vote. And some of them support Trump, and some of them don't. And some of them are indifferent because they don't support politics at all. Uh, and so are sort of like indifferent on the whole division, line of division of whether to support or hate Trump. Um, and if you're new to the show, uh, I refuse to hate. I've done a whole episode on it. I've made, well, I didn't make the meme. I I curated a meme, which I then promote a lot, um, which is a, a billboard. I don't know if it's an actual billboard or if someone photoshopped this onto a billboard, hoping that some billboard like this could exist. Um, but, you know, the refusal to hate. I refuse to hate people, and it's all the different people that we're supposed to hate. Uh, but I, I also don't support most politicians who fall into the pattern I say most politicians fall into. But that's a different episode. Let's reel back here. I've been rambling for 15 minutes, introducing the nuances of the environment as I see them. I think that there's a really fascinating moment of um, shifting support and also what may be a coalescing, because simultaneously there's some sense to the arguments being made by those who are anticipating a Trump landslide victory in 2020. And that's a frightening sentence to say, folks. That's why I preempted all of that with like, I neither, you know, I'm not here to hate him, but I do not support him. Uh, and it does freak me out that there's some... There are some aspects to the logic behind that claim that I'm like, huh, 
yeah, I kind of can't just dismiss that. And one of that is that there's, for as much as there's been a blue wave, um, the right, some pundits in the right argue that the Trump base uh, will indeed bring out from the woodwork a, a, a red wave um, that, like him or not, will support him because he will be the only person on the ticket <laughs> on the Republican side. Um, and we'll talk about 2020 in depth in a future episode. I already kind of kicked that off, but we're going to come back and do a, a, like a whole election process um, series because, you know, elections, they're such fun madness. And mind you, a lot of people think that I support elections or that I'm... Uh, a lot of people accuse me of being a statist, and I categorically deny that. I do think that we have to uh, engage in the systems that exist now, not tear them down and string everybody up. Right? I think we have to engage in the systems that exist now and either uh, heal and uh, reform them or build new alternatives and facilitate everyone to transferring over to those alternatives, which requires collaborating with the systems that exist. You don't just shut them down magically one day and then magically build a replacement, right? Like you have to start with what you've got. And from there, design and imagine the alternative. So, how do we really measure the true uh, success of a president? For some, it is uh, the uh, the cataloging and and tracking of promises made and promises fulfilled. On that front, uh, something I like to do every once in a while on this show is check in with a delightful uh, little website that I believe, to the best of my understanding, is uh, a neutral, nonpartisan, um, you know, just the facts kind of a website. It's called Trump Tracker. The the address is trumptracker.github.io. Uh, no one from this website has contacted me in the past. No one from this website is paying me or in other way, shape, or form encouraging me to promote them. I just find them actually useful. So, days in office, 836 uh, promises made during uh, the process of... Uh, of running for office, 174 that they've chosen to track. As of right now, 84 of those have been categorized as not even started. The first that shows up on their list, which is one of my favorites because it was part of the 100 days uh, bucket as well, like the 100 days of things that he would do. In the first 100 days, I'm gonna... That's not even a Trump impression. I don't even know what I was doing with that, but... Uh, Every president, uh, every person running for president says something to the effect of, I will achieve these things within the first 100 days. It's become quite the trendy thing to do. My favorite uh, not started promise, uh, which is currently listed at number four of all promises from the first 100 days um, in the top five, uh, a five-year ban on White House and congressional officials becoming lobbyists after they leave government office. Ostensibly, part of his drain the swamp effort, and I and I make bunny ears, um, hot air quotes on that because fuck that noise about draining the swamp. He's done, um, well, arguably the exact opposite, right? And uh, but. It's curious that he made the, that he touted this promise. I remember him talking about it. It's like, why does it? Why really? He's really going to make that promise? That's a strange promise. Um, hasn't done a thing on it, and uh, and it's interesting, right? So he's supposed to be 
what does draining the swamp mean? He promised that he would be eliminating the corruption from government. Now, what he did do is push out as many uh, people from offices uh, whose opinions he did not agree with. So, from government, he sh managed to intimidate, shove, fire, or in other ways remove uh, people from office uh, that he he didn't agree with and that he could not bully into uh, agreeing with him. Is that what we want? Is that really draining the swamp? So, did he drain the swamp? He maybe made the swamp look a little smaller, uh, and he most certainly uh, impeded the mechanics of government as they exist, as they existed upon him entering. He impeded them from continuing to operate in the ways that arguably those who support those systems would expect them to operate. Um, he then proceeded to appoint and insert people who were lobbyists and or professional, you know, CEOs, etc., from uh, industries that are in conflict under the jurisdiction of or in open, like, litigation against each other, he put them in charge of those agencies that oversaw the industries from which he drew them from. Which, I mean, even your average conservative Republican just a few years ago, three or four years ago, would have said that would be an obvious conflict of interest, at least if not an outright nepotistic kind of criminal uh, organized crime mafioso tactic. But uh, here we are. Um, other, other fun bits about this uh, from this uh, breakdown here on this website, Trump Tracker at github.io. Uh, in progress, promises that he's got in the works 18 out of the grand total of, of uh, 174. So 84 of them not started. 18 of them started and, and working. Uh, achieved, and we're going to take a closer look at them in a second, 21. My favorite category, broken promises, 43. 43 broken promises out of 174. And compromise, in other words, some sort of halfway, not quite, um, oh, was that a compromise one or is that a I didn't finish one? Compromise. Oh, I guess the the five year ban was a compromise thing and not a not started thing. I misread the color code. They're really similar shades of blue. Okay, so compromise eight of 174 promises suspended Syrian refugee resettlement. Didn't really quite fully suspend it, did he? Let's see what it says. Uh. Oh, apparently, one of the comments says that it really should be categorized as broken again. Compromise. So it lists news articles. Okay, broken. Let's look at the broken ones. It doesn't really spell out a what result, but it does list news articles as to why they categorize it as sources, right? So promises. Broken. Uh, 43. Propose a constitutional amendment to impose term limits on all members of Congress. Never did it. Hasn't done it. Probably won't do it. Institutes a hiring freeze on all federal employees to reduce federal workforce through attrition. He's done the inverse, but he hasn't done this. Uh, complete a ban on foreign lobbyists raising money for American elections. Huh. Isn't that fascinating? He also refuses to acknowledge that Russian interests interfered with 
our previous presidential election, and he's not reprimanded Putin for... That wasn't a promise he made. I'm just commenting that isn't it interesting that those things synergize? A ban on foreign lobbyists raising money for American elections. Let us not forget, folks, and for those of you who don't know, this will be interesting fun fact, um, that the NRA is now currently... Uh, facing uh, some pretty serious investigations. I forget from which, from what department, what state. I think it's the state that they are uh, registered as a nonprofit in, which is probably the state of New York, um, I think, I believe. And, uh, and that they're being investigated for several reasons and that they are have accusations uh, looming over them of Russian money laundering. Um, and of course, then there's the whole, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, that really, um, it's interesting. She should be wildly controversial. Uh, and yet the, the right refuses to acknowledge her. The Trump supporters refuse to acknowledge her. And the left hasn't like rubbed her in their face enough. I don't know why. They kind of just add it on is sort of like this, oh yeah, by the way, um, this uh, Marina Putna, Putna, I forget what her name is, and I'm probably butchering it, forgive me. Um, but you can look it up, Russian spy infiltrated the NRA, separate from the NRA being used to funnel money, although I think she had some connection to, to that activity. So he promised to make a, to ban foreign lobbyists raising money for American elections, and he has not. I wonder, you know, this also synergizes with him refusing to sh to make public his um, to disclose his financial uh, like paperwork and his income tax returns because you know I wonder how much uh, foreign money he got uh, for his, this election. He never labeled China as a currency manipulator, although he's using part of that thinking that they are a currency manipulator in this new uh, round of threatening tariffs, which might come up at the end of the week, which is fascinating. Uh, what other promises, though, has he break? The Secretary of Commerce and the U.S. Trade Representative to identify all foreign trade abuses that are unfairly impacted American workers. Why hasn't he followed up on that? Lifting the restrictions on the production of $50 trillion worth of job-producing American energy reserves, including shale, oil, natural gas, and clean coal. Interesting. He talks a lot about clean coal, but he hasn't done very much to help. Also, let's pause for a second. Clean coal. I mean, I can go on for on. This list has got lots of stuff, right? The wealth On the economy, he, he did promise that the wealthy should pay more. I just caught that. Could totally sidetracked. Uh, clean up corruption in the Washington Act, restoring the National Security Act, restoring the Community Safety Act. Lots of things he hasn't done, and he probably won't do between now and 2020. Uh, but this one, the, the lifting the restrictions on the production of $50 trillion worth of job-producing American energy reserves, including shale, oil, natural gas, and clean coal. He straight broke that. He's going to do that in the first 100 days. What that represents is a set of claims or promises that people like Trump are going to count on their supporters not even remembering the details of, right? He's always going to sweep up the enthusiasm of his base with more finger pointing and more getting mad at someone else to keep their focus and attention drawn away from all the things that, uh, that uh, that he said he would do that he hasn't done. Even some of the things that, he's, that he gets touted as having achieved by his own supporters, he hasn't really thoroughly done, right? A great example, my favorite example is the supposed Muslim ban. Even in its original state, what he called a Muslim ban wasn't even really banning people. Like, you get my point? Even the thing that was people, even the actual ban, the content, the wording of it, I read it, right? Like, I can't really have it in front of me, but but I remember reading it. And it's like, oh, it's, it, it's like he goes out of his way to piss people off, but then also his defense of it, the, the, the reasons that he uses to defend it 
are almost true, but they're just shy of being true, so they're not true, so it's salt in the wound, and like everybody's mad. But his fans don't get outraged that it was never really, really a ban. You know, not a real ban. Not in the way he promised uh, while he was, you know, running around speaking uh, at those rallies, right? A complete and total and absolute ban of all Muslims. No, it wasn't at all. Uh, it did harass, it did open what was worse, and I think the justified reason for which people on the other end of the spectrum um, were upset was because even though it was a really limited thing and it wasn't really, really formally a full-on total Muslim ban, those working in the system that were sympathetic and or in favor of him took it upon themselves to then behave in such ways that were in violation of people's fucking human rights uh, just because they might be Muslim and they could be impacted by this supposed ban, right? Just like Trump not saying anything conclusive about white supremacy has emboldened white supremacists to behave more crassly and act out more violently. It's a trick that, like I always say, he's not as stupid as he acts, and these things aren't as, uh, as accidental as they might seem to be. So, oh, I was going to go off about clean coal for a hot second, if I may. I may have talked about this before, and forgive me. It's just one of those things that boggles my mind. There's no such thing as clean coal, okay? And even the process by which you arrive at the product with that marketing label, when I say there's no such thing as clean coal, of course there's a product with that marketing label, but in actual factual terms, there's nothing clean about it. That's just the brand, right? That's just the, a name on it. It's just a word on the packaging. Uh, but coal at all, it's, it's, a, it's a job, it's an industry that literally kills its employees. Everybody who works in coal mines is going to die from the coal mine. Why do we romance it? Why do we romantify it? What's the, what's the word I'm failing to say correctly? Romanticize it. Why aren't we rescuing those people working in horrific conditions underground in toxic material that's going to negatively impact their health and give them, train them into them the skills and give them the health care to recover from that toxic job that they had uh, and help them get even better jobs in an industry that will not wind up killing them. It doesn't make sense to me, right? I don't, and I do not mean to disrespect or offend anybody who's like fighting for the coal jobs. Like, that's great. It's great. I get it. You want to save jobs, but why those jobs? Those are horrible, horrible, toxic jobs. That's like if somebody got paid to shoot themselves in their body as many times as possible until their body couldn't take it anymore and finally died. But until that day, as long as they strategically shot themselves uh, in such a way that it wasn't instantaneous death, they would get paid a million dollars a week, right? They had to shoot themselves once a week, let's say. Let's say that was your job. You're shooting yourself with a gun for a million dollars a week. And it's ridiculous, right? This example is absurd because coal miners don't even make a million dollars a week. Nobody does. Well, some people do, and, and those people don't even have to suffer any horrible, torturous, uh, self-inflicted harm um, besides whatever they do to themselves because of their own insanity. But I digress. Do you see my comparison, why I'm trying to make such a grotesque comparison? It, it's like if someone's job was literally to smoke seven packs of cigarettes a day. That person's going to fall over dead because of that job. But because it pays them money, we're going to defend them? We're going to protect that job and make sure more people get that job? No. Why protect that industry? The only rational reason that there's any movement to protect that industry is because those who profiteer on it don't want to stop profiteering on it. 
and their profiteering costs human lives. So why do they get to do that? I don't understand. No, they shouldn't get to do that. We shouldn't judge and loathe and hate the coal miners. We should be like, hey guys, I get it that you take a lot of pride in that work because it's been a great fuel for the growth of our historical economy. But now that we understand that it's horribly toxic and it kills you, maybe we should get you a better job. Let's get you some training. Let's get you some medical care. Let's get you some, some you know, everything you need so that you hopefully lower your chances of, lower your risk uh, of, you know, from your exposure from that job to, of dying a horrible death. Um, and then let's give you the skills to work it better. I, I, why is that so unreasonable? I don't understand. Why is it so much more American to fight for the right to, to work a suicidal job? I don't get it. Right? I guess the closest example I can come up with is that someone could throw in my face because I am, like we all are, mind you. Uh, I don't ever claim to be special or better than anybody else. Um, in, in true Christian terms, I was a sinner and I continue to fail to not be a sinner and I'm working on my redemption to stop being a sinner, right? Like that's where we all really are. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. The problem is that even the even those who claim to believe that don't then, you know, ever really seem to know what to do about how to change it. But I digress. I was going to say the class, that was a whole other episode I just branched into and I'm going to go back to this coal thing. Uh, I still struggle with smoking cigarettes. There's a part of me that wants to quit and there's a part of me that enjoys what there is to enjoy out of it and and both parts of me understand rationally the addictive properties etc cetera, etc cetera. i used to work for a nonprofit educating people about the dangers and addictive qualities uh, of cigarettes and what a horrible uh, industry it is that uh, and yet would i should either the right or the left being a, someone who's not one or the other, would I stand up to in some sort of I must defend my rights kind of way, stand up to some legislation banning all cigarettes? What if they just said, fuck you guys, we're just going to ban cigarettes, they're too horrible and terrible, and it's the only way we can ever prevent cigarette cancer-related death, right? It's the only way we can do it, we just have to ban the industry, and, you know, fight it as it probably goes underground and becomes a controlled substance uh, and, you know, goes on the black market right up there next to fentanyl. Uh, what would I do? Would I just finally jump off the high dive, you know, diving board precipice of the frightening cliff that is quitting cigarettes? Would, would any of us who struggle or don't struggle... Who would any of us who smoke cigarettes because we enjoy them, whether we think of ourselves as someone who's trying to quit or not, would we give in um, to a rationally explained uh, for our own good, uh, for the benefit of our own health, uh, national or global ban on cigarettes, a complete dismantling of the industry. And mind you, when you do that sort of thing, you couldn't do that and do it correctly and do it you, you would not be doing it correctly, I mean to say, if you did not find a way to uh, beneficially, um, laterally move everyone involved in that industry into some other industry. If you just ban an industry and say, fuck you guys for working in it, that's kind of a dick move. I, you know, My support of it, I think, would depend on that end of the bargain, less so much on my thinking about whether or not I have the right to go light up a cigarette. Mind you, talking about it has made me want to wrap up this show and go take a cigarette break. Uh, I honestly don't have an answer, but I ask you, if any of you who happen to listen to the show are smokers of cigarettes, how would you respond? Would you fight? Would you protest? Would you... How far would you fight? Would you... Uh, would only a certain level of civic 
uh, protest and civil disobedience, uh, and then you, you then it's like enough, or would you, you know, join some sort of rebellion movement because cigarettes is your last straw of like you can't take my freedoms away, uh, despite all the understanding, knowledge, and scientific data indicating that those of us who continue to smoke are essentially, um, you know, quadrupling and just infinitely uh, compounding our likelihood of dying directly from uh, that behavior. Uh, how does one answer that question? I don't know. I don't have an answer at this time, but I'm going to ponder it. I'm going to go smoke a nail in the coffin as uh, as some uh, old-time cigarette friends of mine used to say, and ponder that question, and uh, maybe I'll talk about it in a future episode. As always, uh, thanks for joining me on my completely disorganized, harebrained, um, mad scientist uh, discourse and exploration of what's going on in the world today. Uh, what was my point opening with the show? Uh, Trumptopia. We are in a clusterfuck of confusion, and... To quote a movie I watched a couple nights ago, I don't know what the fuck is going on, and you sure as fuck don't know what the fuck is going on, so don't act like you do, is what I would say to those in the base who are 112% certain that Trump is some format of savior, and that he's here to really, truly radically change the status quo uh because there's a lot of people who have me here's where i started from i've noticed that on facebook uh someone created the meme of the quote about how uh i think it was joe biden who said it uh that uh you know trump uh if we give trump another eight years he will um radically change the character of the country and people over there on on in in trump camp uh actually kind of love the sound of that and so they've appropriated that meme and are sharing it saying uh-huh hold on to your cojones it's coming something's coming a big change is coming trump and there's some interesting sources that seem to be a third wave of alt-right media sources, like beyond Breitbart, right? Like it's, it's I, and I'm not entirely 100% certain that I want to put uh, the media persona labeled the singular letter Q over there in this same box, but there appears to be, in my surveying of the social media landscape and my limited, uh, you know, circles of exposure, um, there seems to be a really weirdly strong um, source of uh, rhetoric that's got a, a really passionate sub-following or a following that is all a sort of sub-thing, like I said before. Um, and I, I'm worried because the vibe I get from them, to wrap up my point and, and bring the show to a close, is that there's, you know... If the Mueller report itself is to be taken at face value, if you don't paranoidly think that Robert Mueller himself is some sort of nefarious, evil, deep state uh, agent for uh, an agenda that's here itself to destroy America, if you think that Robert Mueller is just a person who is more realistically kind of a natural statist as opposed to a hyper... Um, like ideological status, but he's just sort of a person who believes in the institutions of American government, right? Um, he's He doesn't think of that. I don't think he sees that as his religion. He has whatever the fuck personal religion. I've never heard him comment on it, but if he's an atheist, whatever it is. Uh, but you see where I'm saying, where I'm trying to place him in a, in a as a sort of national identity bucket? Um, if we take him at his word, if we presume the best possible uh, reality of who he is and that he's not um, someone controlled by the Illuminati. He's not some deep state uh, uh, anti-Trumpist that's trying to get away with a coup 
He's just a guy who's worked in government his whole life, uh, who may or may not have flaws, who may or may not have vices, who may or may not have some ego problems just like the rest of us, but that is earnestly trying to investigate what he understands to be the facts to the best of his ability given his background and training, right? Let's just pretend for a hot minute that that human being is just that. And mind you, they're all puppets. So don't get me wrong. I'm making like an exceptional clause theoretical argument here. Uh, they are all puppets, but it's not in the fashion than most people might think. I've already talked about that in past episodes. You can tune into those or hang on to it for a future episode because I'm going to come back to it, I'm sure. But let's just give, let's laying down whatever assumptions you might be starting with about the human being known as Robert Mueller, uh, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say he did his best to bring the facts and that he respected that memorandum of, of, of practice that the a sitting president will not be indicted by the Department of Justice. Let's just accept that that's a given. I think it's ridiculous that Americans are so confused by that and have such wildly juxtaposed opinions about what that represents. Um, but I digress. That itself could be a whole other episode. If we look at the Mueller report and then we look at the words of the president and his cohorts, the simple fact of the matter is Trump and his mouthpieces are objectively lying about what's in the Mueller report. Now, we can get into a debate about what is in the Mueller report and how much of that is cockamamie poo-poo and how much of that is hard fact. But at this moment, I'm trying to draw a level of delineation that makes that argument irrelevant. Let's pretend, let's pretend Robert Mueller did his best, but somehow he got hijacked by the deep state. And although he's a decent human being and he did his best, the Mueller report is actually totally fake. The Trump camp is still lying about it. What I'm saying is, regardless of your opinion of the words in the content of the report, the words that the Trump people are saying about what they claim to be in the report are totally fake. Those are made up bullshit things. There is no exoneration. The facts of the matter is that Mueller went out of his way to say, although we cannot bring charges, these findings do not exonerate the president. That's what's in the report. That's a fact. You can agree or disagree with Mueller's honesty, but that's what he wrote is my point. And I think that despite the seeming effectiveness of the most recent clusterfuck of fanfare of bullshittery from everyone in Trump's camp, the base is going to start to go, wait a minute, I can get the report for free on the internet from the government, right? I did a, like, just Google it, Mueller report. You can buy it for $1.99 on Google Play. You can buy it for $7.44 at Barnes & Noble. $7.04, 40 cents cheaper at Amazon.com. And $1.99 at eBay. You can also read it on Wikipedia. And you can get it for free. Uh, where is it? I saw it. Read the full Mueller report on CNN. Okay, but they're an evil industry you know, of baby eaters. So that's probably a fake version of the Mueller report. But like it's, it was, oh, the Mueller report from the, from the Department of Justice, from the actual justice.gov uh, website, okay? You can fucking read it. And the fact of the matter is, no matter what you think of Trump, he is categorically lied about the content of this report. And that alone, in and of itself, is a form of obstruction of justice. Boom. Mic drop. And I'm not a Democrat, folks. I'm just saying, I would like to 
If we're going to take America back to any place, let's take America back to the place where the vast majority of us actually feel safe and protected by the rule of law, as opposed to paranoid that we are slippery slope sliding towards a, a really dark place of totalitarian oppression, where lies are the law and the law is lies. Now, some say we've already been there for God knows how long. Uh, I would just say that that should be the new goal, that we should get to a place where statements like no one is above the law are true and fair and balanced, and that the law isn't so corrupt that it doesn't matter that no one's above the law which seems to be what's going on now. So, I digress. We need to... One thing I do agree with, I, I'm all willing to uh, reach across the aisles, especially since I don't stand on any of the predefined sides of the aisles. Um, I'm willing to concede that, to a certain degree, yeah, the American system needs to move forward and move on. I also um, think it's ridiculous that uh, anyone who's innocent would categorically um, refuse to participate in exonerating themselves, but only lie about being exonerated, right? If he was truly innocent, he wouldn't have to lie about what's in the Mueller report. If he's truly innocent, he would have already truly participated in all these investigations, I think. Um, but I've already said that before in past episodes, so let's... Uh, Let's wrap things up for now and then regroup uh, for future episodes where I'll uh, try to touch on some different things uh, and uh, post me your thoughts, comments, questions about what you'd like uh, me to address or uh, look into, uh, if I've talked about it before, if I haven't talked about it before, etc. As always, um, I am your humble host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo, and uh, you, dear listener, are the change that we are all going to see in this world because each and every single one of us is being called, you know, to what's really going on, which is the thing I talk about in all the other episodes. I mean, all the other segments. Wow, I really ran out of steam there at the end. Uh, wanted to close strong and I feel like I'm spluttering into uh, a horrible, embarrassing, going to edit it in post. Peace out. And that is the latest madness from behind the orange wall. Thank you for listening to GMT, a special segment of the Almost Daily Zencast. Stay woke, Trumptopia. Stay woke.